Hi, I'm Laverne Cox, and you're watching Out at the Center. <laughs> May is Membership Month at the Center, and Out at the Center will be bringing you stories from people in our community, like you, who are Center members. Center members keep our doors open 365 days a year to offer life-changing programs and services. When you join this month, we have a special gift for you. To find out more, go to gaycenter.org slash membership. And now, that's your Marcus's story. I came to the center for the first time because uh, I'd met, I was desperate for, for a friend and I just didn't know anyone. I had met one friend. This friend told me that he, was at the, he did this thing and uh, he was going to this camp. You should check it out. I said, uh, okay, you know, maybe, I don't know. He said this youth enrichment services. And so I did, I went. I ended up fitting right in. You know, I, I wasn't you know, too young, I wasn't too old, and it was one of the best decisions of my life. I went to our camp, I made amazing lifelong connections. Yes has really given me a way to develop my leadership skills, develop my communication skills. What do I know about myself? What do I know about my community? What does that, that word mean, community? You know, who's in my community? How do I respect the people that are in my community? No, I think that there's just so much that, that still needs to be done, and the only way it gets done is by people taking an interest in what goes on in their community. These are really tough times, and People are still being murdered for being queer. They're still being harassed in school. There's still a lot of stigma uh, surrounding HIV and AIDS. There, is, there are just a lot of issues that our community has to deal with and has to face. And in tough times, I really want my community to back me up. And I think that's exactly what the center does. Next year, uh, age out of yes, but I will definitely be involved in some way with the community, with the center, uh, for quite a long time. This is my center. Make it yours. Become a member today at gaycenter.org slash membership. The center has been a force for social change for over 25 years. When something happens to our community, this is where people come to organize and fight back. For many young people, the center offers an entry point to the world of activism and social justice, creating the leaders of our movement for tomorrow. In this next segment, the work of first-time producers we meet three people at the center who have dedicated their careers to work for social change. The first time that I walked through these center doors, it took me 15 minutes to actually enter the space. I sit outside for the longest time, worried about who is gonna see me at the Gay and Lesbian Center, um, would I be outed? And then I looked up at the giant rainbow flag above me and realized it was a lot more obvious that I was queer standing under the giant gay flag, so it's probably safer to go inside the building with the other LGBT people. What a lot of people don't realize about the center is that the center's very existence as an openly LGBT organization, owning our building on West 13th Street, making the community visible in all of its facets is in itself a force for change. When I first came to the center in October of 95 to a youth group called By Glitney, which was a youth-run youth group that had existed since 1969, and the center gave it a home in 1986. Um, and so it had been here it having a safe place to meet for 10 years by the time I showed up. And that was my first impression of the center. Certainly our community has a history of street activism mm -hmm. and sort of spontaneous demonstration, but it's much more effective if there's a gathering place for people to come together and say, on this, at this time, on this day, we'll be in this room talking about this issue. Bring your passion, bring your thoughts, and let's organize around it. The center actually um, sponsored myself and a number of other young people for the first time to go to the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force Conference um, called Creating Change. I was able to facilitate for a national group of young people, um, one of the first youth institutes that existed for that conference. And that was really my first taste of youth empowerment from the adult community. I had experienced it from my peers. Um, that was the first time I was able to share a platform with other adults and allies. Um, 
on a larger national scale. Better minds than mine are saying this is the year. This is the year when we're really going to be able to advance initiatives like the Dignity for All Students Act for about school safety and anti-bullying measures, uh, gender for gender non-discrimination, and for marriage in New York State. I was in Congressman Nadler's office last week in Washington, and there was a young woman in that office who was working there, and she told me that she was an intern, and she was a master's degree student in uh, political science at SUNY Albany, and she had just come to his office as an intern. She was gonna be there for six months. And then she told me that she was a graduate of the center's Youth Enrichment Services Program. I can't speak for kids all over the country or everybody's individual programs or approaches. I know from, from doing that kind of work in schools in New York City and going in and talking about sex issues, sexuality issues, or about um, LGBT issues generally, sort of doing the homophobia, transphobia 101 kind of instruction. If, if you frame it right, kids really have a, a really good intuitive understanding. I mean, they, there is, I'm not going to pretend that there's no homophobia and transphobia among middle schoolers in New York City. Of course there is. Um, but it, they're, the culture is saturated with that, and they get the same messaging we all do. But they're, um, there's a, a, it's a very affirming piece of my work. It's the right to be included with resources in government programs for tax purposes, LGBT families to be legitimate and productive parts of the American population. So we're really working very hard around LGBT family issues. I see how the YES program has grown um, from two small weekly groups, creative writing and young women's group, blossom into running up to five to six programs per day. I know that from this point forward, the sky is truly the limit for the center and what it does for youth work and the, and the future of young people. I'm proof I found my way back home less than 10 years later to give back to, specifically to this community, to this center and to this program. So I'm very excited to work here and to be a part of this um, force for change. Julia Porfido has been involved with the Gender Identity Project since it started in the 80s. She's now a peer educator and tells about her personal journey in this next segment. You can see more profiles, learn about programs, and see a calendar of events at the GIP website. Go to genderidentityproject.org. Hi, my name is Julia Porfido. I just started working here as a peer educator. Originally, I found out about it through um, YES, which was Youth Enrichment Services. GIP has been a wonderful, I can't, I can't express more what a wonderful resource it's been throughout over a decade for me. Well, when I was young, you know, I knew that I wasn't heterosexual. Um, but I didn't exactly know where I belonged um, when I first discovered, like, you know, the gay world. Um, and I actually snuck into a couple of um, gay haunts. One of them was Uncle Charlie's, which was here in the village. I just didn't see myself there. Um, I, I couldn't pinpoint it. I didn't know if I was gay or not. And when I discovered my first transsexual, uh, around the Harvey Milk uh, School, um, it was like uh, an epiphany for me. And that's when I realized that that's what I was. I was a transsexual. So I felt um, like a woman inside, mm -hmm. but somehow my outsides didn't match that. I've had a significant plastic surgery to attain uh, the female image, to match my insides with my outsides. It's been you know, a very costly endeavor. Um, and it's, it's been a, a long process. I did it for me, but I, can't, I, I certainly feel that, you know, um, you know, society has an influence on the way transsexuals feel about themselves. As aware as society may be becoming, they're still not fully aware, and there's still the stigma attached to transsexuals. When I see clients come into the center, um, and seeing some of them who look somewhat destituted and, um, you know, helpless, uh, lack of guidance. It does remind me of where I was, you know, over a decade ago, how difficult it was for me. And 
for me, it was even more difficult because the resources weren't as available as they are now. And to see these, you know, helpless young people, you know, who have been ostracized by family members come in here, um, it's, it's almost like viewing it as a beacon of hope for these young souls. So um, it makes me feel good that there's a place here that wasn't always here for them. Over a third of New York residents were not born in this country. It's no surprise then that LGBT immigrants make up a growing number of visitors to the center, accessing our immigrant support services. Though the initial adjustment was daunting, the two individuals in this next segment have built successful lives here and are active participants in the social action group, advocating for immigrant rights. My name is Katia Camilo. I'm, I'm from Dominican Republic. My name is Lutfi Machida. I come from uh, Indonesia. Many of the main issues that LGBT immigrants present with, uh, among them is uh, isolation. Isolation from others, isolation from the gay community in general. First, I don't have uh, many friends. I was really uh, struggling for uh, almost two years just to get a job. At the beginning, I just uh, worked as uh, selling fabrics at the garment district, and um, they pay very, very minimum. My first job was in, the fa in a factory. The pay was very bad too. I, I was um, uh, $5.50 per, per hour. And that was very hard. My partner sort of um, support me to send my resume um, to this fashion consultant firm. It's a very small firm. And at the beginning, I just working as a part-time freelance, but then they asked me to work uh, full-time. Within uh, two years, they actually give me a sponsorship for a green card. Then my, I have an uncle, he, he is a dental technician, he has a dental laboratory and since four years ago I have been working with him. It's, it's family business, you know, and now I, I am like, like a manager um, we are planning to, to, to share the business. I'm responsible for basically meeting every single LGBT immigrant that walks in through the doors at the center. I always joke and I say that we're like a gay United Nations here. I could have a Muslim, a Christian, a Jew, a Santero, a Buddhist, all in the same room talking about their similarities as, and their experiences as gay individuals growing up in cultures that do not tolerate their, their, you know, their way of being. In my country, I didn't have the, the el apoyo, support that I have here as a lesbian. I feel comfortable here. I feel like a, well, like in my home. Yeah. I always like to read. I usually go to, to the Bronze Library. I can get many books there uh, in English and Spanish. I'm learning um, Balinese dance in New York. So I just started uh, about eight years ago, maybe, and I learned with a great Balinese artist here in New York. I listen to Oscar Merengue because I'm from the Dominican Republic, salsa, bachata. Uh, the other thing that I do, or I have been doing, I usually come to the center for a meeting, and that happened usually on Tuesday. Center Care is very much involved uh, in advocacy for immigration rights and immigration law reform. We also this semester initiated a social action group. So people that have been in the program for a while that are kind of ready to do something and give back to the community or help the center out, they are learning to become activists. George emailed me um, to join with this immigration group action 
Uh, every other Tuesday we have a meeting at the center here. Se podría hacer más porque si el solo hecho de ser gay, les, lesbiana, es, es un problema en sí, que será venir de un país donde, o sea, sin documentos, no tienes familia y es muy duro, es muy duro. Entonces, de alguna manera, yo me siento identificada con, con esto. Eh, me, me duele, me duele. That's hard. That's true. They get a lot of love from each other, a lot of support, a lot of friendships grow out of there. And then they're the ones that asked, what can we do? This country is the country that have opened his door for me. It's wonderful. Fortunately, I can get a good job and um, I have a, someone who support me and love me. Pride is in the air, and that means mark your calendars for Garden Party, the center's kickoff to Pride and the premier LGBT tasting event in the country. But I think this is my 27th Garden Party. You guys are all volunteers, right? Yeah. yeah. Very cool, I can tell by the pink shirt. We're having a great time. We're enjoying ourselves and enjoying everyone. Yeah, I've missed a few meals, so this is a good place to catch up a little bit. Nice to have you here. Well, the garden party is the official beginning of LGBT Pride Week, so you have to be here, yeah. rain or shine. Yeah. Here. One of the best parties in New York every year. Yeah, most definitely. Thank you for being such great leaders. Have a wonderful Pride. In light of recent vicious attacks on members of our community or people perceived to be lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender, Out at the Center takes a look at the work of the Anti-Violence Project and what each of us can do to fight homophobic and gender-biased violence and report hate crimes. Michael was a good friend of mine. He lived with me for about three years. One night, uh, Sunday evening, we found out he was going out with a friend, didn't think anything strange of it, but at about one in the morning when he wasn't back and two detectives entered our building, we knew that something really was wrong. We saw an increase in violence um, against the LGBTQ communities in 2007 of 24 percent nationally. We also have anecdotally seen in 2008 an increase in both the number of incidents and the severity of violence. AVP came to us through a friend. They sent a representative out immediately to be with the family, to start to provide service for that family. It was the hardest moment of my life so far. And to, to think about how hard it would have been for his parents to actually go through this process. Um, without AVP, it would have been much, much harder. The Anti-Violence Project's mission is to eradicate violence against and within the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and HIV-affected communities. We do that through a combination of direct services, community organizing, and public advocacy. We see a huge range of different types of incidents reported. We certainly see people who are dealing with ongoing harassment, uh, verbal harassment and targeting. Vandalism is something that we get lots of reports about. People who are being harassed by neighbors, by coworkers, by fellow students, bosses, landlords, people who have regular access to them. as a common type of, of a thing that gets reported, as well as certainly stranger assaults, all the way up to sexual assaults and murders. He was essentially brought to a remote location by a f people who intended to rob him. And after finding out he had no money, they tried to hit him and when he ran away, he got hit by a car. For many LGBT people, being harassed uh, is such a commonplace experience that 
uh, unless something is really, really severe, um, it's not necessarily something that people think they should talk to somebody about. There's a variety of issues on why people choose not to report hate crimes, but a lot of it comes from the fear of, of even interacting with NYPD or outing themselves. I think there's a few things that are important for people to know who've, who've experienced any kind of targeting, mainly that people should know that it's never their fault, that there's not, oftentimes people experience this feeling of, I should have been presenting differently, or I should have been more careful, or I should have adjusted my behavior in some way. And we really encourage people to not go there in terms of that self-blame, and to also watch out for each other and to make sure that when other community members are targeted that we don't also go the route of blaming them for any violence that they've experienced also. We formed after Michael's death about three years ago, and our main intention was to help victims of hate crime and to create educational awareness programs throughout uh, communities of underfunded schools. AVP looks at not just who identifies as LGBTQ or H or who considers themselves a part of those communities, but also what organizations serve those communities, where are the community centers like the center, what are some of the other systems like housing and welfare and the police and all of the different places where people may interact with a particular system. Some of the outreach that we do are specifically to crimes. I do flyering in local businesses, bars, and community organizations. I also do mass emailing, street contact with individuals, and just to let people know that AVP is a safe place to come and report these heinous acts. We have a 24-hour bilingual confidential hotline that can be reached at 212-714-1141. Recent incidents of violence include a stabbing on Staten Island over the summer, the murder in Bushwick in the fall, and we've seen across the country an increase in severity and the number of incidents against LGBT people, particularly trans folks and particularly trans folks of color. We know generally that with increased visibility comes increased vulnerability. And so the more visible we are, the more able we are to advocate for our rights. But at the same time, the more vulnerable we are to people who don't necessarily agree with our civil rights analysis, our identities, or our um, ability to be in the world. Nathaniel Frank, author of Unfriendly Fire, visited the center to talk about his book on the military's Don't Ask, don't tell policy. The RAND Corporation, which was a very respected think tank with long-standing ties to the military, they sent out 75 social scientists across the country and concluded in a 500-page report, $1.3 million funded by taxpayers, that Open the Gay Service works. It works in foreign countries, it works in fire departments, works in analogous institutions, and it can work here so long as the military leadership puts their support behind it. Instead, they turned to a panel of six admirals and generals, and a staff below that, who wrote a 15-page report. This group was called the Military Working Group, simply asserting over and over again, homosexuality is incompatible with military service. I spoke to the general who first headed that group, Minter Alexander, and he told me a few things that surprised me. He said, we didn't have any empirical evidence. It was impossible in that group to get an objective analysis of what was going on. Not because there was none. They didn't look at it. He said, we didn't even know what sexual orientation meant. And that's how we ended up with a policy uh, for the last 16 years that has ended up firing 12,000, over 12,000 service members. There are good people in the military. Even the people who spoke to me doing these mea culpas, they were the good guys. They supported a bad policy because of fear and prejudice. But now, they've come clean. And I have a lot of optimism that the stars are aligning and that we will see change. Kicking the smoking habit is especially important for HIV positive people. In this next segment, Quincy Quitter is ready to stop smoking and found support to do that in a group. If you want help to give up smoking, come to the center where our LGBT smoke free program can give you the support you need to kick the habit once and for all. Today is day five, and oh man, it's hard. 
but I'm really doing it this time. I can't believe I've gone five days straight without a cigarette. You know, I never thought I'd make it this far. I've been living with HIV for over 10 years, and I've been real lucky. I've lost a lot of friends to this disease, and I promised myself I'm not going to let smoking take me down. We can keep doing this thing together. If I can do it, you can do it. You can call me anytime if you feel that you're in trouble. We've learned how to support each other with this virus, and we can do the same thing to quit smoking. Here's my number. Call me. Day or night. And that's all for this edition of Out at the Center. As the credits roll, we'll see a live music performance called Women Sing the Blues. Kim Hampton, Crystal Money Hall, and Cheney Sims sang with the accompaniment of Bill Sims. I'm Laverne Cox. Thanks for watching and stay in the love. Hey, lady. Honey, your husband is cheating on us. I let you in. You broke my heart. What did I expect? They told me you were trouble from the start. Torn a little love. Blowing me down. The guitar is important in the blues because it mimics the voice, and so you're going to hear that call and response going on in this. Hard times here, hard times all around. Well, I believe hard times, they're going to carry me down. I feel it, don't step in the water. Oh, yeah, I'm coming out free. Yeah, been on my mind, oh, sisters, we're two of a kind, so my sisters, I'm keeping my eyes on you, but God bless the child, let's get his Thank you.